Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. We have come to honor the life of a man of character, Brother James Johnson, in our memorial service on today. Let us bow for the invocation. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are so grateful that you are indeed the Father of all mercies and the God of all comfort. We thank you for Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And through him we find comfort because he sent us your precious Holy Spirit. So now, Father, we invite the Holy Spirit into our memorial service on today to help each of us to have comfort and the hope of eternal life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In our order of service, we will have the Old and New Testament scripture read to us by Minister Dolores Poindexter, after which she will also render unto us the prayer of comfort. And then we will have an elegy of organ and strings, which was written by Mr. Trent Johnson, the son of Brother James Johnson in that order. The Old Testament scripture is taken from the book of Psalm 27. That's Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of, of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though the host shall encamp against me, my heart should not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, and the secret of his tabernacle shall hide me, and he shall set me upon a rock. The New Testament scripture reading is taken from the book of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. That's John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may also. And whither I go, you know, and the way ye know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goeth, and how can we know the way? 
And Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his precious holy word. Let us pray. Father God, we love you. We worship you. We magnify your precious holy name. We give you glory, honor, and all of the praise. Father, we come to you this beautiful day that you have made in the matchless, magnificent name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, thanking you for being the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulations. Therefore, Father, we invite the Holy Spirit into this service to comfort the hearts of the loved ones. Strengthen by might with your spirit, the Johnson family. Give Sister Johnson, Father, peace. Peace in knowing that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Therefore, Brother Johnson is in the better place. Brother Johnson is in the better place because he is in the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we are so grateful to you, Father, for that. We thank you, Father, for so loving us that you allowed Jesus to die on the cross at Calvary so we could have eternal life. To that end, we thank you for Brother Johnson's life. We thank you that Brother Johnson had a complete life. We thank you that he had a fulfilling life. We thank you that he had an excellent life, not a perfect life, but a life that enabled him to press toward the mark for the high calling of Christ Jesus. Now, Father, we pray for the messenger of the hour. We ask that you lead, guide, and direct Reverend McLaughlin to bring forth your word as you will to the end, that you will be glorified and the family and friends gathered here today will be edified and comforted through the preached word. Therefore, we pray that everything that's said or done for the rest of this service will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. And we thank you in Jesus' name, amen.
what a sound of peace, what a sound of comfort. Thank you, Brother Trent Johnson, for that elegy of organ and strings. And we thank God for his presence in this place. Now we will have acknowledgments by the children of Brother Johnson, and we will start in this order. Uh, Miss Nicole Jackson, the daughter, Mr. Trent Johnson, the son, and then Brother Kevin Johnson, son, will come forward, and then after which we would have a poem by Miss Trudy McKnight. If you all will come to my left, your right to the podium in that order. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Got to get over that presentation we just saw, <laughs> so give me a minute. Um, as was spoken, I'm Nicole Jackson, or Nikki, as many of you know me, and I'm the youngest child of James Johnson. And so I was told because I was the youngest, I had to go first. But I think that's like a big brother thing, I don't know. <laughs> um, but as I was thinking of what I would share this day on my father's celebration of life, one word continually came to my mind. That word was grateful. I'm so grateful that James Johnson was my dad. He was a loving, smart, funny, very family-oriented, fun, and adventurous father. He always told me how much he loved me, how proud he was of me. He was my biggest cheerleader and encourager, even to his last days, keeping a positive attitude until the very end. And I'm so glad that I was able to be with him when he passed to try to do the same for him, as was the rest of my family. My dad was very involved in my life as I was growing up. He knew who all my best friends were in the neighborhood, would take me to the mall, to the movies, and even to King's Dominion. He saw my first and only home run in Little League softball, <laughs> my only witness. He bought rollerblades together and would skate at Costco Park in the parking lot. He would give me advice along the way to ensure I was going down the right path. And I didn't even realize he was teaching me right from wrong and training me in the way that I should go. It just felt like I was hanging out with my daddy. I see the same level of engagement and involvement in the parenting of me and my brothers. He was an awesome example in parenting for us. Dad and I used to take my nephew and nieces, David, Alicia, and Janine, and my kids, Quentin and Nina, down to Newport News, Virginia, to visit his parents, Wilbert and Evelyn, or Lean, as her friends and family called her. Dad loved spending time with his grandkids. We go shopping at Patrick Henry Mall, wrap Christmas gifts, and go to the celebration of lights in Newport News Park during the holidays. Grandmommy would cook our favorite meals using the veggies from her huge garden and spoil us the same way she did my dad as he was growing up as an only child. I heard from my aunts and uncles that even when dad was a little mischievous growing up, Grandmommy wouldn't let anybody spank him. He was spoiled. <laughs> but dad still grew up to be one of the most generous people I know. He would send cards to family members cousins, aunts, uncles for birthdays and little gift in them, put a lot of thought into his Christmas gifts that he got for his grandkids and his great grandkids. He gave my son Quentin his first car. He helped pay for his kids and grandkids to go to college. 
because he really believed in the importance of education. Dad left us all with a legacy of the importance of sacrificing for and contributing to the next generation. Dad and I took my kids, Quentin and Nina, down to Fort Eustis Base Golf Course in Newport News where he gave them their first le golf lesson, which you might have seen some of the pictures there um, when they were small. Um, gave Quentin his first set of kitty golf clubs. That was such a fun and hilarious day watching Dad wrangle these little toddlers all over the driving range. Dad even taught my husband, Tyrone, how to play golf across the street, Joint Base Andrews. Dad was a patient and enthusiastic teacher, especially when it came to golf. My college roommate and best friend Lisa Simmons and I used to talk about our dads all of the time back when we were in college. Both of us were the youngest in our family and self-proclaimed daddy's girls. We used to talk about how much we loved our dads and how well they took care of us growing up and said we would marry men just like that when the time came. Loving, family-oriented, supportive, funny, intelligent. We had the ultimate prototype for what a father should be in our own dads. I'm incredibly thankful for my daddy, James Johnson. I'm sad because I miss him tremendously already, but I'm grateful to God for the blessing of a loving father that he was. Love you forever, daddy. Nikki. Good morning. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for being here to celebrate the life of my father, James Johnson. Uh, my name is Trent Johnson. I'm the middle child, second born, and this is my wife, Nicole, who has uh, joined me up here. Uh, in my comments that I'm about to make, I'd just like you to know that many of the things that I will say about my father are also true of my mother, Alice Johnson, who is here present as well. Thank you, Dad. Thank you for being a good and responsible father to all of your children. Thank you for teaching me what it is to be a person of good character. Thank you for teaching me to treat all people with respect and to get along with others. Thank you for teaching me to be a reasonable person Thank you for teaching me what it is to be a loving and caring person. Thank you for sharing your wonderful sense of humor and fun. Thank you for all of those delicious Saturday morning breakfasts that I had as a child. Thank you for those two wonderful cross-country road trips from coast to coast. What an adventure. Thank you for all of those summers in Virginia being with relatives and making new friends. Thank you for taking me to meet the older generation of relatives in Virginia as I began my genealogy research as a teenager. Thank you for buying the World Book Encyclopedia for the family when I was a child. It is through this series of books that my knowledge, understanding, and curiosity of the world around me began to expand beyond my own boundaries. Thank you for teaching me to save money. Thank you for teaching me the value of education. Thank you for showing an interest in my schoolwork in progress. You never hesitated to have a conversation with a teacher if it was warranted. Through your service in the United States Air Force, thank you for introducing me to the greater world and the unique differences between people all over this country and the world. Thank you for driving me to my piano lessons on Saturday mornings all of those years as a child. It was through this introduction to music that my musical life began. Thank you for taking me to my first orchestral concert at the Kennedy Center. 
thank you for taking me to hear pianist Vladimir Horowitz at Constitution Hall, a once in a lifetime experience. Thank you for scolding me and correcting me when I needed it. Thank you for your patience and understanding as I've developed into an adult person. Thank you for believing in me. Thank you for teaching me to be an open-minded person and receptive to other points of view. Thank you for giving me the good sense to marry my wife, Nicole. Thank you for telling me to love my wife. When I went on my second date with my soon-to-be wife, Nicole, she had a flat tire, which I speedily re uh, repaired. She was most impressed. <laughs> Thank you, Dad, for teaching me the basics of car maintenance. Thank you for being a father to my wife, Nicole. Thank you for telling me to remember to visit the doctor regularly. Thank you for being generous and kind and teaching me the value of fairness. Thank you for reminding me to call and check in regularly with my mother. Thank you for helping to support my college education. Thank you for coming to all of those concerts of mine in Baltimore, New Jersey, and New York City. It meant a lot to me. Thank you for being my biggest fan, as you were of all your children. Thank you, Dad for teaching me all of those values that I carry with me daily and therefore can impart to my daughter Ava and all I come into contact with throughout my life. Thank you for many, many wonderful memories. Thank you, Dad. Thank you, James Johnson. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Kevin Johnson, and I happen to be the oldest. I was the one that was supposed to set an example. <laughs> um, but uh, I am here today to honor my dad, and I guess, you know, we're supposed to share about his life, and that's what uh, we're doing here, and I'm just so thankful for my dad, and he was a good guy. I mean, he was really a good man. Um, so I just want to kind of start out and just say that I may not be as eloquent um, as my brother and my sister were. You know, I'm, a, you know, I'm just going to speak from my heart uh, regarding my dad. Um, and when I think back of my father and who he was, the first thing I can think of that came to mind was that dad was a giver. Uh, all my life, I can remember, uh, he just gave to his family uh, in more ways than one may think. Um, when we were growing up, I remember times that uh, we had three little children in a one-bedroom apartment, and Dad used to buy us groceries often. That was back in the days when you can get a shopping cart full of groceries. You remember? Some of y'all might remember when you could go to the grocery store and the, and the whole shopping cart used to be full for about $100. You know, nowadays you can't even get the, the little seat piece where the, the children sit. That right there is your $100, you know, but dad used to bring us grocery cart load of groceries often. A lot of times it was around Thanksgiving time, the holidays, and it was really a blessing to us as a young family growing up. And he did it out of the kindness of his heart. He didn't we didn't ask him to. It was just something that he did because he loved his family. And I could think about uh, times when I think about dad and his cars. You know, he, he used to always bless his family with the cars when he was always getting ready to buy a new one. And um, 
Uh, I can't remember a time where he even traded a car in. As far as I can remember, uh, all of his cars, he just gave them to his family members. We were the recipient of a couple of them. And, and they weren't just shabby, they weren't hoopties. You know, they weren't shabby cars. I mean, they were, you know, luxury Chryslers and Volvos and stuff that he would just be a blessing to his family. And um, so, so yeah, and, and, it, and it's funny because, um, uh, oh, wait a minute, let me get rid of that. Messed up my notes here. I need to be able to see what I'm saying. Uh, yeah, so he used to just um, be a blessing to his family uh, in that way. And even in his passing, he's still being a blessing to people, even now that he's gone. And a lot of times it wasn't just family. I noticed that he it was also a blessing to a lot of his friends and things like that. But that was just the kind of person that he was. Uh, my dad was a man of character and integrity. Uh, he was just a good person. I mean, he, he was a law-abiding citizen. Uh, paid his taxes, wore seat belts when seat belts weren't popular. You know, he was he was just a good guy, had good character. I remember a time when we were growing up, can't remember, we were living in California at the time. Uh, me and my dad were together, and we found a bag on the ground. It was a brown paper bag, had money in it. And I was like, oh, dad, this is a bag with money in it. And I remember my dad saying, we got to turn it in. And I remember we drove to the police station and he turned a bag of money. I don't, you know, I was a little guy then. I don't even remember how much money was in the bag. I just remember this, some, this is free money, you know. And we drove to the police station. He turned the money in. And the folks at the police station said that, hey, you know, it's a certain amount of days. If no one claims the money, then it's yours. Uh, I guess evidently someone did uh, eventually claim it because we never got that money back. But, but it, as, a, as a young man, it just showed me that, you know, my dad, you know, he was a good guy, you know, because I even think about myself today. I mean, you know, if I find a bag of money on the ground, you know, I'm going to have to check with the Holy Ghost to see if, if can I keep this? Uh, you know, do I got to turn it in? But, you know, the Holy Ghost going to make me do what my dad did. You know what I mean? I got to turn the money in. But that was the kind of guy he was. You know, he was a guy of great character and integrity. You know, and I just noticed those things about him. Uh, he and I would often talk about work and work ethic. And, and he would always talk about, you know, the value of education and trying to better yourselves and everything that you do. And he would always tell me when I was growing up that, you know, it doesn't matter what you do. He just said, whatever you do, you just try to be the best at it. He said, if you're going to be a ditch digger, be the best ditch digger. He said, if you're going to be a hamburger flipper, you be the best hamburger flipper. He said, whatever you do in life, you just strive to be the best at it. He was like, don't be a kiss up, because you don't need to be a kiss up, but your work ethic should be able to speak for you. And if it doesn't speak for you, then it's not your loss. But you be the best at what you can be. And I never, I, I held on to that until today. You know, I think about it all the time in everything that I do. You know, I try to make sure that I, I try to be as excellent as I can with what I do. Uh, not, not only because of what God says in his word, but also from what I got from my father. Dad, he was also, he was also a little stubborn. Uh, you know, he was, he was a guy who's kind of set in his ways from time to time. Uh, once he decided that he made up his mind about something, you know, it was, it was pretty made up, you know, and he was like, you know, I, when I get ready to change that thing about me, I'll change it, you know, and that's just how he was. And I think he got a little bit of it from my grandfather. My grandfather was that way. You know, he was kind of that way, and I don't know, you might have to check with April to see if it rubbed off on me a little bit. I don't know, but, you know, he had that about him. Um, and my dad was an observer. You know, he would observe things. He would observe people. Uh, I remember growing up uh, in the neighborhood, uh, you know, he would kind of observe the friends that I uh, used to hang around. You know, this was B.C., so this was before Christ. So I was doing before Christ stuff, okay? And my dad used to, you know, you want to find out about my friends and things like that. And, you know, as a young person, you know, you don't want your parents really to know what you're doing, so you kind of keep it hush-hush. 
And so when my friends used to come around, you know, dad, he was a great conversator, so he could conversate with just about any, on any level. And so he would talk to my friends and he would start laughing with them. And, but he would, then he would throw little stuff in there like, like, yeah, <laughs> and it's really great when you're a little buzzed too, huh? And my friends would be like, yeah. And I'm like, oh, no. I'm like, no, don't say that. Because, see, Dad was, he was also probing at the same time, you know. But that was, just, that was just his way. You know, he had a way to conversate with people. He had a way to observe people. And, um, you know, I think about uh, uh, that in the respect, too, that, you know, Dad, he, he really wasn't like a, a religious guy, so to speak. Um, uh, a lot of it had to do with uh, a lot of bad examples that he saw. Uh, I remember he told me a story about somebody that he grew up with, maybe in his late 20s, early 30s. It was a person that he was real close to. And this person that he was real close to said that he had given his life to the Lord. He was going to start ministry. He gave his life to the Lord. And the downside about that is, is that because it wasn't necessarily according to knowledge, and this person went out and tried to start a ministry while forsaking his family, and the short of it all is that his family fell apart, his children went a wayward way, and eventually what he tried to start in ministry never worked out. And so my dad kind of looked at that as kind of like, well, see, that, that, was, that was a hard example that he saw, and it just kind of let him know that, that must, if that's what it means to give your life to the Lord, I, I think I'm good. Because my dad was a man of character, and he had, he, had a lot, uh, he had a lot more character than some Christian folk that I know. And so when my dad took that position, you know, he just observed folk. He said, I see what they're doing over there, mm-hmm. Then he would see what they're doing over there, and he was like, mm-hmm. And it's like, well, as a matter of fact, you two go to the same church. You go to the same church, and y'all go to the same church, but y'all are living two different things. I'm seeing two different messages here. So basically, he resolved in himself. It was like, well, you live your life, and I'm proud of you, and I'll live the life that I'm living. And so that was something that I had always had in my heart about my father, that I really wanted him to really have a real relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was my prayer for the longest time that this is, you know, this was my desire, not only for my father, but for my family. And, and not to just have a relationship that, that, that you know of God, but you know God through a personal relationship. Talk to him through prayer and let him talk to you through his word. And you develop that personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So we, in the hospital, uh, a few days before he passed away, it was a Friday, and I talked to Dad about, you know, I felt that, you know, I'm, I understand the natural, and I see what's going on with the doctors. I hear what they're saying. I see the machines and everything. So I leaned over to Dad on Friday, and I was like, hey, Dad, you know, um, suppose, you know, you don't make it out of here this time, you know? And he kind of took his same position, and I was like, okay, you know, because there's at some point there comes a time where we all have to stop talking. We gotta gotta live something. You know, we gotta live something in front of people. And so some of y'all know that when things happen on a Friday, God can do some things in two and three days. And my cousin sent me a text message, and he and the text message said, It ain't over until God says it's over. And I was like, wow, it gave me some encouragement. I was all excited about it. I'm like, yes, and I don't know how my cousin meant it, but I took it as that even though some plant and some water, God is the one that gives the increase. And though the, we know that though the body perishes, the inner man can be renewed day by day. And so my prayer was that, God, I, want, I, I need you to come down. I need you to... Uh, I need for my father to be able to encounter you right here in this hospital some kind of way. I don't know how. You know, I didn't try to think it up because we know that God's thoughts are as far as our thoughts are, as from east is from west. And uh, I know when the family uh, came to the hospital and we had special time with dad and, you know, we would pray with him and 
there was a moment we were praying with dad and, and praying in the spirit and we were leaning, laying hands on him and just, you know, thanking God for his life. And I just want you all to know that my father accepted Jesus Christ right there in that hospital room. And, and I'm so glad about that, not that I needed to witness it myself, but see, we know that the outer man is going to perish. That's just, we all got to go that way. But the most important thing is that before we check out of here, we need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm just so thankful for that because though my father laid down his physical body, he rose in victory. And I thank God for it. Amen. In Jesus' name. Good morning. My name is uh, Trudy McKnight, and I am the cousin, more like sister, of uh, Wanda uh, Johnson. And the last time that I saw Wanda and Jim together was Thanksgiving. Wanda, Jim, and Melissa actually came to her house and had dinner, and we were very blessed to have them there. What I'm about to read you is a poem that reflects Wanda's feeling regarding Jim and his journey. And what I can tell you from my heart is that when you saw them together, you saw love. They both had ailments. They both had illnesses. But what you saw were two people who deeply cared about each other, who tried to take care of each other, and more importantly, who just simply loved each other. This is from Wanda. I'm greatly saddened by the recent death of my dear Jim. He was a wonderful man and devoted husband. Our amazing 11 years of marriage will comfort me in my thoughts forever. Farewell until we meet again. His journey's just begun. Don't think of him as gone away. His journey has just begun. Life holds so many facets. This earth, it's only one. Just think of him as resting from the sorrow and the tears in place of warm and comfort where there are no days and there are no years. Think how he must be wishing that we could know today how nothing but our sadness can really pass away. And think of those whom he touched for nothing loved is ever lost and our dear Jim was loved so much. With love, your loving wife, Wanda. And before I take my seat, I'd like to read some representative samplings of cards that have given the family so much comfort. The first, with caring sympathy, in the loss of your husband. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. With God, love lives forever. May the compassion of those who care surround you, the memories of shared joy, encourage you and the warmth of God's love just simply embrace you. With sympathy and love, Joyce Summers. The Lord is close to all who call on him. As you walk through this time of loss, may you know that the Lord walks with you and he will comfort you. And this is from Wanda's daughter, Jim's stepdaughter, Hillary, her husband, Ron, and their two uh, children, RJ and Michaela, who you saw in the uh, clips and the photos. Finally, sympathy. Dear Wanda, extending deep and heartfelt sympathy to you and your family. Sorry for your loss. My prayers and blessings are with you and your family during this difficult time. And this is from Jerry Coleman. Thank you all. But truly, we thank God for those remarks uh, from all of the children and um, from Sister McKnight. We thank God for a man of character, a giving father, a one who left an example for his family and those who knew him to follow. And we are so grateful, Brother Kevin Johnson, that 
your prayer was answered. He gave his life to Jesus Christ. And now he is in the presence of the Lord. And he is alive and he is well. And we thank God for the tremendous deposit that he has left in this family. I would also like to say on behalf of our pastor, Bishop John A. Cherry II and his lovely wife, Reverend LaWanda Cherry, the Johnson family from the heart has engrafted you into our hearts. From the front row to the back row, from my right to your right. We are a loving church and we are here for you. This is not in words, but it is in demonstration and the manifestation of the love of God that shed abroad in our hearts. And so with that said, we want you to know, see, and experience the comfort that can only come from God through Jesus Christ and his precious Holy Spirit. We want you to know, and we mean it, that beyond today, that we are here for you. We are simply a phone call away. Ask brother and sister Johnson sitting here, and I'm speaking to brother Kevin Johnson and sister April Johnson. We love God. And because we love God, we love his people. And we are so grateful for the opportunity we have to express this love towards you, to comfort you, and to be here for you today and beyond today. Please be rest assured that if there's anything that we can do and give within our power, we will do it. Amen? Amen. I would like for us to participate together in this portion of the service through the reading of the obituary silently. The family of James Johnson sincerely thank all of you for your prayers, comfort, love, and support, your many acts of kindness and expressions of sympathy have been a blessing to us. May the Lord Jesus Christ bless and keep you in perfect peace. We ask that you would now prepare your hearts for the song of preparation which will be ministered to us
by our very own psalmist, sister, and Mrs. Robin Coffee, after which we will receive the message of hope, which will be rendered to us by our very own Reverend Walter V. McLaughlin III. Hear ye him. It is well 
with our soul. It is well with our soul. To Brother Kevin and Sister April Johnson, my very, very good friends, we've even met each other down in Myrtle Beach. I would like to echo what Minister Jacqueline Walker said on behalf of your pastor, our pastor, and our First Lady, Reverend Lawanda Cherry. We know that we're here with you, we're walking with you, not just today, but beyond this day. To the Johnson family, we thank God for this opportunity to minister to you. Thank you for entrusting us today to honor the life of James Johnson. We thank God for so many comments that have been made. We thank God for the life that was shown before us. And though he is not here with us, we have seen the reflection in those comments, thoughts, and lifestyle of his children and his family. And we thank God for that. I shouldn't be before you very long. It should only be a couple of hours. <laughs> Won't be before you very long. Um, you know, I do want to say something. Brother Kevin Johnson and I had conversations, and we've had conversations since the passing of his father. And um, I want you to know that, uh, you know, he, he, he may be running from his calling. <laughs> I thank God for his, his ministry gift in music. But uh, thank you for preaching the message for me today, sir. I'll just add a little bit more to what you have said already. So if you'll pray with me and pray for me, then we will get started. Father God, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, and we thank you for who you are. We bless and we glorify your holy and your righteous name, for you are God, and you are God all by yourself. Father, we thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. We thank you that you loved us so much that you gave us your only begotten son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins and now he has prepared that place for all of us that where he is, there we shall be also. Thank you for the life of James Johnson and we thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit who dwells in us and I ask that by your Holy Spirit you lead God and direct me as we honor the life of James Johnson. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen? Amen. Thank God. Amen. Amen again. Well, we're here today for a memorial service. And a memorial service is different from a funeral. There is a difference. You see, a funeral is when we bring in the remains and we mourn over them, mourn over the body, we mourn over the, the, the person, we mourn over them even though they're not here. But this is a memorial service, and in a memorial service what we do is we remove the body so that we can concentrate on the memories of the deceased. We keep alive the memory of the deceased, and what we do is we recall and we recollect and we remember and we reflect and on all the things that they could only do, and we look at the times that we spent with them. What we do in a memorial is we preserve the memory of the qualities of the person. We talked about the character of this man, and you're going to preserve his character and his nature and his distinguishing attributes, things that only he could do and the things that he only did for you. And we all love our mothers and we love our fathers, but we only have one for ourselves. And what they did for us, we're going to always remember what they did for us. And you see, but let me explain something to you. When, when, we, when we die, the real you, which is a spirit, see, we're a trinity. We have a body, we have a mind, but the true us is spirit that lives on the inside of us. And see, here's what death really is, and, and James chapter 2 lets us know, as with the body without the spirit, that's death. So right now, the body has been, the spirit has been taken from the body, and now we have to remember the person that we're honoring today. But see, death is not a punishment. 
when you're in the Lord. You see, we don't concentrate on the body because that body can no longer contain the real James Johnson. You see, he's absent from the body, and the Bible lets us know that for we know that if we have an earthly house of a tabernacle of this house, this earthly house, if it were dissolved, we have a building of God not made by hands, eternal in the heavens. And we are confident, I say, and rather to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You see, God created us in his own image, and he created us in his likeness, and he created us to represent him here in this earth. He created us to show forth his character in our lives. And we're here today to concentrate and to keep alive and to preserve the memories and the qualities of James Johnson. We want to remember those things about his life that only he did for us, that he did for you. You see, we read in the obituary, and we want to remember some things about James Johnson. We want to remember that he served in the United States Air Force. But not only did he just serve, because there are a lot of people who serve. There are some who go in, but they don't stay in. But Brother Johnson stayed in. He got his 20 plus five months. Amen? He stayed in, and he retired from the military. He had a, distinguishing, a distinguished career where he received numerous medals and numerous accommodations. And he was stationed all over the world, as you heard his son say. He was stationed in Florida, and he was stationed in Vietnam. He was stationed in California. He was stationed in Greece. He even worked at the Pentagon. You see, I worked for the Department of Defense years ago, and the one thing I regret is that I never got a chance to go into the Pentagon. What a blessing to have a father who introduced you to culture and introduced you to things in the world. What a blessing to be taken from coast to coast and a blessing to be able to see different things and to have your eyes open to know it's not just about what I see in the mirror, but it's about all of us that we can see throughout this world. What a blessing to have gone from place to place and to remember all those things and how exciting it was. You see, I was just excited when my father took me around the corner. But y'all had an opportunity to see things. What a blessing. We want to remember that even after his military career, that he worked for over 30 years as a federal contractor in the computer science industry. You know, we get more and more dependent on computers every day. And we'll never know the work that he did and the things that he did as an analyst that changed our lives. He worked for computer corporations, and he worked at, even worked at the NSA up at Fort Meade. We read that he was a compassionate man, a caring man, whose love for his family was most important for him, and it brought him a source of great joy. I know there was a great, great, a great source of joy because I see it in you, and I remember it in your remarks as you brought forth and honored your father. You know, he, he, we want to remember this, and it, it, it may mean more to me than it does to some of you, but we want to remember that uh, he was a golfer. You see, I, I play golf. Um, I try to play golf. I mean, I'm out there <laughs> on a golf course chasing the ball. But anyway, but see, it was something great in the obituary that I loved. See, he had two hole-in-ones, two hole-in-ones. Two in his lifetime, in his lifetime of playing golf. And that really stuck with me because I also have two hole in ones in my career. Now, my first one, nobody was around but me. And see, some of y'all getting that. But I did it. And everybody tells me since nobody wasn't around, it didn't count. I said, it does count. I said, this is what I say to them when they say that to me. I say, God saw it, and they shut up. But do you know how rare a hole-in-one is? The odds are 12,500 to one. And he had two of them. Tiger Woods has had 20, but, you know, we're not going there. <laughs> we're not going there. These are the memories that we want to remember, his character, 
his conduct. We don't want to remember his commitment to his family and to his friends. And I love a line that was printed in the obituary in the very first paragraph, the last sentence, that he was surrounded by those who loved him. And those who will commit to honor his memory by living their lives to the fullest. By living their lives to the fullest. And I want to make sure that those who remember him and those who are striving to live their lives to the fullest, I want you to do as he did. I want you to remember that you have to be connected to the source of all life. You can strive to live your life to the fullest, but if you're not connected to the source of all life, it's not going to be a successful life. You see, because the Bible tells us in John chapter 1, verse number 4, it says, In him, that is Jesus Christ, was life, and the life was the life of man. For a few minutes, I just want to preach from this subject. It was presented by his son. And I'm going to bring it home to us today. You must be born again. You must be born again. And Brother Johnson, thank you. You said, uh, you know, we hear people say that all the time, that I'm born again and I'm a Christian and I know the Lord. Well, let me tell you something, something very interesting. Only Christians can be born again. But let me not get ahead of myself. Now, we know a person by their actions. We know a person by their character. We know a person by the things that they do. But one thing we cannot know and be fully assured of is what's on the inside of a person's heart. Because what's in a person's heart is going to come out in their life. No one knows another person's heart. The key is that we must know our own heart. Each of us has to know our own hearts and that our hearts are right towards God. And the only way we can know our heart is right towards God is we must be born again. And when our heart is right towards God, we do those things to show our heart condition. Those things that were shown in the life of Brother James Johnson, the life that he led for you. What did he do? He did the will of God. He did what God asked him to do. He helped and touched the lives of others. You see, there are not many people who want to get involved in the lives of others. As Brother Johnson, Kevin Johnson was saying, that his father would talk to his friends to try to get involved. He was trying to probe, but he was concerned about what his family and his children were involved in. Because he realized and understood that he was going to have to give account for what God gave to him. He gave his children as an inheritance. You see, we want to turn away before we want to get involved. Most people would want to turn their heads away from someone instead of turning their heads towards them. See, when our heart is right towards God, we guide those who seek our help. You know, we realize and know that no one is perfect. And no one got to where they are on their own. We all needed help to get to where we are. And when our heart is right towards God, we did as James Johnson did. We are a father figure to those who don't even have natural children. You know, it's a blessing to have your father be involved in your life. It's a blessing to have your father engage with your friends. It's a blessing to have him be engaged in your life. It's a blessing to have him around when most fathers are not. We celebrate and remember his life today. If we really understand what it means to be born again, it would not be so hard to distinguish between those who say it and those who really are. See, because most people don't get saved when we think they, where we think they are, where we think they should get saved. In other words, the Bible tells us that some plant, some water, but God gets the increase. Most people don't get saved in a church setting. 
It happens when no one else is around and they're going through and they cry out to God. Lord, save me. You see, I can think about my own, my very own life. It was not a church setting where I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I would believed in God all my life. It was in a college dormitory when I gave my life, when I confessed with my mouth. What was already a belief in my heart and in my mind. And I'll never forget that I was strangely moved. It came over me. You see, we don't, we want to, think that people can only get saved in a church but see our life speaks of who God is in our life and our life is a testimony and people are drawn to God because of us you see and people are drawn to us because we have God on the inside of us there's a light that God places in us that draws to them and when they come to us let's not speak of ourselves Let's speak of the one who lives on the inside of us. In the book of St. John, chapter 3, a man came to Jesus seeking real answers. He had answers, but they did not match up to what he was seeing uh, in the life of Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus was going about doing miracles, and there was boldness in Jesus, and the doctrine of truth was in Jesus, and he was teaching the truth. And then, if you go back a few chapters before chapter 3, Jesus changed water into wine and he ran the money changers out of the temple. And those who sold oxen and those who sold doves and prayer cloths and all this water and stuff. See, he, took, he made sure that their money didn't change from their pocket, from their pocket to the money changers pocket. Then in chapter 3, Nicodemus came to Jesus. He was a learned man. He was a Pharisee. He was a strict keeper of the law, but only in action but not really in his heart. He came to Jesus by night because, see, Nicodemus had a way. But he realized it wasn't the way. And many of us have a way in our lives, but it's not the way. You know, you hear people say, you know, hey, I, I don't think it takes all of that, and I don't think I need to go to church every Sunday. I don't think I need to go to church on Bible Sunday. I don't have to tithe. I don't have to do all those things. I don't have to give God my life. I don't have to work in a ministry. I know God. I got things under control. I got it together. But see, we heard read earlier in John 14, verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the way to the Father. I am the truth and I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me, except through me. You see, Nicodemus was looking for a way. But Jesus said unto him in verse number three, Jesus answered unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. Nicodemus came, and he kept going back and forth with Jesus about how can this be? How can this be? Jesus said, listen, I've, if I told you earthly things, you, you would cleave to earthly things, but I'm telling you spiritual things. And then he got to the crust of the matter. And we see this sign held up in football games and sports arenas all the time. It says, John 3.16. Jesus said unto him, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus said, if you don't accept me, you can't see and you can't enter in. You can't see. And you can't be where I am. I'm reminded of what Brother Johnson, Kevin Johnson said to us. From Friday to Sunday, there was praying. And then he gave his life to Christ. It reminds me of the thief on the cross who was dying with Jesus. He says, remember me when I come into thy kingdom. Jesus said, this day shall you be with me in paradise. 
When I say born again, I'm talking about delivered from above. I'm talking about Jesus saving our lives. I'm talking about restoring us into right fellowship with God. It only takes a moment, the twinkling of an eye. It doesn't take a long time. Peter was walking on the water. He started sinking. And he said, Lord, save me. Whew. He reached out his hand, brought him back into the boat. God desires all of us to be in the boat. I told someone the other day, I said, I'm so glad that I'm saved. So glad that I know the Lord. If I'm on the boat and if I'm swabbing the deck, I'm glad. You know why? Because I'm not in the ocean. I'm not in the sea. I'm on the boat. Now, I may not be having dinner with the captain, but I'm on the boat. I'm saved. I'm not in the ocean floundering. God's kingdom is his power. Jesus is the Lord of everything. We have to be born again. See, we have to know, we have to have knowledge, we have to understand the lordship of Jesus Christ. We have to enter in and come into him. When God formed man of the dust, he breathed into us his spirit, and man became a living soul, and then man had the right to fellowship with him. Let me tell you why we have to be born again, because Adam sinned in the garden, and sin entered the world, and it separated us from God. But God sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to cleanse us from all sins so that we could be restored to right fellowship with the Father so that we could have a relationship with him. And now Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father and he's making intercession for us. And now when we call out to an almighty God, when we are saved, God looks through his son his blood washes us, and he hears us when we pray. You see, you want to cherish his life. You have to remember what Jesus said in John 10, 10. He says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall, not, and shall go in and out and find good pasture. The thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He says, but I come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. You see, unless we are born again, we cannot receive the power of God to do his will. We cannot have everlasting life with him. We cannot see our loved ones again. And by the comments that were made today, I know that you want to see your father, your husband, your friend in eternity. So you say, preacher, how can I be born again? John three sixteen. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We have to trust in, we have to cling to, we have to cling to the salvation that only comes through Jesus Christ. How do you get saved? Romans 10, 9 says that if thou would confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Church, family, we must be born again. We must be born from above. But let me tell all of us a truth. All of us are going to live forever. I mentioned earlier and I'll mention it to you again because the real us is a spirit. The spirit came from God. I read to you, God breathed into our mouths, into our nostrils, and we became a living soul. That spirit, the real you. You see, the flesh is going to return to the earth, but our spirit is going to return to the God and Father who created us because Hebrews 9.27 lets us know it's appointed unto every man once to die. But after that comes the judgment. And see, because we're going to live forever, God's going to welcome, Jesus is going to welcome all of us. He's going to welcome all of us. You see, he's going to give all of us a greeting. There's going to be a reception for all of us. But not all of us are going to stay 
on the boat. In heaven, Jesus is going to welcome everybody, but not all of us are going to be able to stay. Jesus is going to welcome everybody with two greetings. And because of what Brother James Johnson believed, he confessed with his mouth. He, and now he hears Jesus saying this to him. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many. Enter into the joy of the Lord. But unless we have done what Brother James Johnson did, accept Jesus Christ, we may hear this welcome is really going to be an unwelcoming. Depart from me, ye worker of iniquity. I never knew you. But let me bring, a, as I bring a conclusion to this message, I want to let you know Nicodemus came looking for answers. Jesus said, you must be born again. And so let me give you the end of Nicodemus' life. And his encounter with Jesus. In, chapter, in, in John chapter 7, Nicodemus sought to defend Jesus after all the men that the chief priests and Pharisees sent to bring Jesus back. Nicodemus says, do it not our law? Judge a man before we hear him? And know what he doeth? Do we judge a man before we know? See, Nicodemus was part of the Pharisees. But then truly because he believed, and truly because he loved God, the end of Nicodemus' life really comes in John 19. After Jesus was crucified, in verse number 38 in John 19, it says, And after Joseph, Being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Christ. And there also came Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh, alloy, and a hundred pound weight. And they took the body of Jesus and wound it in linen cloth with spices as the manner of Jews were. Two men carried Jesus away. One of them was who came to Jesus by night seeking answers. Hearing Jesus say, you must be born again. Family and friends, it's never too late to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're going to strive to remember his life, if you're going to strive to live your life in honor of his life, if you're going to strive to do as he did, then do as he did. Accept Jesus Christ. So when it comes our time, there be joy, unspeakable joy of our family because we know that our loved one is absent from the body and present with the Lord. Today, make your heart right towards God by accepting Jesus Christ. You must be born again. If you would just for a moment bow your heads. I want to make sure that no one leaves this place without a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we come to honor the life of James Johnson, don't dishonor his life by not following his example. If you're here today and you know you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you're watching here today, if you're watching, I want you to say a simple prayer. And I want you to believe in your heart the words that you say, and you shall be born again. If you know that you need to pray this prayer, repeat these words after me and believe them in your heart. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, and I'm sorry for my sins. Create in me a clean heart, and renew a right spirit within me. I confess with my mouth. I believe in my heart, the Lord Jesus Christ, that you raised him from the dead for my sins. I accept him now as my Lord and as my Savior. 
Father, fill me with your spirit so that I can do your will, so that others may know through my character that my God is God and that Jesus is Lord. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you pray that prayer and you're with us today, on the way out, please see one of the ministers. There's a booklet that will explain what you just confessed and help you in your walk with the Lord. Everyone, let's give God praise, honor, and glory for his word. Praise, honor, and glory for the life of Brother James Johnson. At this time in our service, we're going to prepare our hearts for military honors. I would ask if everyone would please stand at this time. Seated.
May we all please stand for the benediction and prepare ourselves for the recessional. May Almighty God, the Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the power of his Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. May he carry you safely throughout the day as we remember and honor the life of James Johnson. It's in Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Uh, we can have someone to assist us with the flowers, about five people, family, friends, uh, friends of the family, if they could come up and just help us.